Number one, the 24 elders. The Bible describes multitudes of beings that have intrigued many people for years. Who are the 24 elders? Beyond our understanding and perception, there exists a magnificent throne room in heaven, radiant with divine light and power. This place is extraordinary. It is where the most powerful being in the universe resides. John's journey to the island of Patmos and his subsequent visions, including that of the 24 elders, is one of the most intriguing episodes in the Bible. Amid the wonders of the supernatural realm, one presence stands out, a circle of 24 elders dressed in white, crowned with gold, seated on thrones around the main throne. Who are these figures? Why are they here? After addressing the seven churches, John suddenly found himself in the very throne room of God. He saw God seated on a throne, appearing like precious stones. Around this throne were 24 other thrones, and on them sat the 24 elders. These elders wore white robes with golden crowns on their heads. In this video, I will explore all the most mysterious beings recorded in the Bible. Therefore, I invite you to subscribe to the channel, click the like button, and watch this video until the end. The elders, along with the four living creatures around the throne, prostrated themselves before God, casting their crowns before Him and declaring, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for You have created all things, and by Your will they exist and were created. Revelation 4 verse 11 there is no place in the book of Revelation where the identities of the 24 elders are detailed. On the other hand, it is highly likely that they are representatives of the church. Some believe they are angelic beings, however, this is highly unlikely. It is clear they reign alongside Christ by the fact they are seated on thrones. It is repeatedly proclaimed that the church rules and reigns with Christ. The Greek word translated as elders in this context is never used to refer to angels. It is exclusively used to refer to men who have reached a certain age and are capable of ruling. As angels do not age, the term elder cannot be attributed to them. Although angels can serve dressed in white, the color white is more frequently associated with believers because it represents the righteousness of Christ that is attributed to us in salvation. The elders wear golden crowns, indicating they are not angels. Angels never receive crowns, and there is no evidence they wear them. The cherubim, living creatures, serve as motivation for the 24 elders to engage in worship, as the cherubim worship God every hour of the day and night. The elders are seen as representatives of God's people, particularly in the Old Testament. They are adorned with the crowns of victory, and have moved to the place their Redeemer prepared for them. Number 2. The Wheels in the Old Testament Angels are referenced 108 times in the book of Exodus. Moses also encountered angels during the wandering period in the desert. What are the wheels? The term wheel in ancient Hebrew refers to wheels, but of particular interest are the wheels of God's throne mentioned in Ezekiel's vision. God chooses to open the heavens to Ezekiel temporarily. The description of Ezekiel's inaugural vision is one of the most challenging passages to translate in the entire Old Testament. Ezekiel first recounts where he was when he saw the vision. He attempts to put into words something that could not be clearly explained, using similes to describe it, comparing it to other things to give an idea of what it was like. As Ezekiel observes a dark, threatening cloud of lightning and fire approaching from the north within the cloud, there are four illuminated beings shining brightly. Before witnessing the wheels, Ezekiel saw creatures later identified as cherubim. After seeing the cherubim, Ezekiel saw the wheels, akin to the wheels of a chariot. The best object to imagine what Ezekiel saw is a gyroscope. Ezekiel was describing something that could move in any direction without needing to turn. Keep in mind that Ezekiel was describing the indescribable. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the ground beside the living creatures for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheel and its workmanship was like sparkling topaz, and all four had the same form. 
Their appearance and workmanship were as if a wheel had been within a wheel. When they moved, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. As for their rims, they were high and impressive, and the rims of the four were full of eyes all around. Whenever the living creatures moved, the wheels moved with them, and when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose as well. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they went in that direction, and the wheels rose alongside them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Whenever they moved, they moved, and whenever they stopped, they stopped, and whenever they rose from the earth, the wheels rose alongside them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Ezekiel remained constant among the wheels and the cherubim. Wherever the cherubim went, the wheels went. He reported that the Spirit of God was manifesting in everything that was happening. Ezekiel was also perceiving the omniscience of God. The multiple eyes that he saw represented the complete consciousness of God, who sees and knows everything. This great book begins with a vision in which Ezekiel receives a revelation from God of angelic figures. In this vision, God calls the prophet to be his spokesperson and watchman for the Hebrew exiles. This vision is the first of four in the book and may be challenging to visualize what Ezekiel saw or expressed. The senses of exceptional knowledge and intelligence. The Ophanim are also mentioned in a similar manner in Ezekiel 10. Ezekiel was to understand that the chariot or throne chariot of God was in motion. The image may seem bizarre to the modern reader, but it should be remembered that this is a visionary experience and surrealistic characteristics may predominate over realism. Imagine a terrifying five-ton African elephant running toward you with its trunk stretched out, eyes dilated, and massive legs pounding the earth. There is nothing between you and it except flat grass, and your heart is beating wildly. How do you escape? What do you do? Know that animals much more fearsome and powerful than African elephants once roamed the earth. The behemoth is described as this great animal in the book of Job. It all started with a wealthy man named Job, residing in Uz with his extended family and vast herds. He was upright and correct, always striving to live a moral life. He had a very disciplined relationship with God. God exalts the virtues of Job to Satan, but Satan argues that Job is righteous only because God has blessed him. Satan challenges God, saying that if he were given the green light to inflict suffering, Job would change and curse God. God allows Satan to torment Job to test this bold claim, but prevents Satan from taking Job's life. Job receives four reports in one day, each informing him that his sheep, Servants and ten children died due to invaders, thieves, or natural disasters. In the midst of his suffering, Job tears his clothes and shaves his head, but in his prayers, he continues to praise God. Satan reappears in heaven, and God gives him another chance to prove Job's worth. Testing Job, he curses his birthday, comparing life and death to light and darkness. He wishes he had never been born and that his birth had been veiled in darkness, feeling that life only adds to his agony. He wonders why God evaluates people based on their actions, when God can quickly amend or forgive their actions. Job is perplexed about how a human being can fully satisfy the justice of God, Given that God's ways are mysterious and beyond human comprehension, Job is brought to his breaking point by the ordeal and as a result becomes resentful, anxious and terrified. He laments God's injustice in letting wicked people prosper while he and many other honest men suffer. Job wants to confront God and protest, but he cannot physically find God. He thinks that wisdom is hidden from humanity, but resolves to pursue it fearing God and avoiding evil. In the end, God decides to intervene. On several occasions, Job prayed to God to have a conversation with him, and his wish was granted. The occasions when God communicates with Job occur in the midst of a storm. There is much humor in the way God addresses him. God reminds Job that he is the creator of everything, going through his magnificent activity of creating and sustaining the world asking Job if he could match that work. He ends by asking if Job is capable of judgment, 
telling him it is presumptuous for Job to believe that God should explain himself to him. Job is made to feel very small. Eventually, Job responds, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. In the second round, God doesn't speak about himself as the creator, but about his creatures. The speech is filled with humor once again. He asks Job for his opinions on the behemoth, as if these fantastic beasts held the answers to significant life questions. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. It eats grass like an ox. Behold, its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its belly. It moves its tail like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are tightly knit. Its bones are like tubes of bronze, its limbs like bars of iron. It is the first of the ways of God. Only its maker can approach it with his sword. Previously, the focus was more on the mystery of animal creation, but now the focus has shifted to fear and still the magnificence of God's creations, the identity of the behemoth. The behemoth is one of the few biblical creatures that historians have long debated. The academic community is still trying to reach a consensus on many aspects of this creature, but they know two things. It was huge and had a navel. The evidence of a navel shows it's not an egg-laying animal. It eats grass like an ox. Its power is in the stomach muscles. God seems to delight in describing the wonder of this extraordinary creature, pointing out its size, appetite, and behaviors along the way. The image is clear. If Job cannot compete with his fellow creature, how could he compete with the God who created the behemoth? The Hebrew word behemoth has the same form as the plural of the Hebrew word behema, which means beast. It's possible such a beast roamed the earth with people. Was the behemoth a hippopotamus? Many people think that God had in mind what we call a hippopotamus, one of the largest, most powerful and dangerous land animals in the world. The hippopotamus was definitely known in biblical times, especially in Egypt. The Romans reduced their population because of the damage they caused to crops. Although called a river horse, the hippopotamus is more closely related to pigs than to horses. The open jaw of a hippopotamus provides a compelling image. Or was the behemoth an elephant? According to most biblical apologists, behemoth in Hebrew refers to a four-legged beast, which they believe to be an elephant. Those favoring hippopotamuses do so because Job 40 verse 23 talks about the creature's huge mouth drinking up the rushing Jordan River. Based on verse 19, it seems the creature described in Job's story was too large for people of the time to defeat. These descriptions cannot be attributed to any current animal. Throughout recorded history, humans have hunted and killed elephants and domesticated them for various purposes, such as labor and war. When the book of Job described the behemoth as the foremost of God's ways, so powerful that only he who made it can bring his sword near it, it was not an exaggeration. The Leviathan Compared to the terrifying, uncontrollable power of the Leviathan, man's pride and grandeur were nothing to boast about. The more humble is man in the presence of God, and that's the point. Neither Job nor anyone else has the right to critique God's work. The Leviathan is a large aquatic creature of some kind. The Bible describes it as a fearsome beast with monstrous ferocity and great power. The Hebrew word for Leviathan has the root meaning of coiled or twisted. Isaiah 27 verse 1 speaks of the Leviathan. On that day, the Lord with his sore, great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan the swift serpent, Leviathan the coiling serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Whatever this sea monster was, its strength and wild nature were well known. The sea beasts glorify God. The Old Testament contains several mentions of the Leviathan. According to most of these passages, the Leviathan is a real creature that people knew of, although they kept their distance and knew of it by reputation and not by sight. In Psalm 104 verses 25 to 26, God is praised as the one who created the habitat for the Leviathan. 
To combat Job's inflated image of himself, God wanted to demonstrate to this man how small he was in the grand scheme of things, using Job as an example. Job 41 gives the most detail about the Leviathan as a real marine creature. In that chapter, God describes the Leviathan, emphasizing the size, strength, and ferocity of the animal. Job 41, verses 1 to 5. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? Will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as your slave for life? Can you play with it as with a bird or tie it on a leash for your young girls? This creature was first mentioned in Job 3 verse 8. May those who curse days curse those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. In this context, Job refers to how sailors and fishermen cursed the threatening creature known as Leviathan in the same way. With intense emotion, Job cursed the day he was born. Generally, Leviathan is considered a mythical sea monster or dragon that terrorizes sailors and fishermen. However, in the context of Job 41, God does not seem to consider Leviathan mythical. There are diverging opinions on the description of Leviathan. Some suggest it could be an ancient dinosaur, similar to a dragon, that may have survived until Job's time, or remained in human memory, serving as an example for God to refer to. On the other hand, some believe Leviathan is simply a powerful crocodile. In this context, God's purpose in providing Job with this account of Leviathan is to demonstrate to Job how powerless he is before this creature. There is nothing Job can do to stop this powerful creature. Job stands no chance. The cherubim are a group of celestial beings created by God. They are the first in the angelic hierarchy to appear in the Bible immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve. Genesis 3 records the events in the Garden of Eden. Having violated God's command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was likely that Adam and Eve would extend their hands and also take from the tree of life and live forever. As a result, they were expelled from their earthly paradise. But what would prevent Adam from returning to the garden and disobeying God again? The answer is given in this verse, Genesis 3 verse 24. So God banished man and placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. From these two sources in the Bible, it appears that the primary responsibility of the cherubim is to declare man's sinfulness and protect God's presence from sinful men. As much as Adam longed to return to the Garden of Eden, the cherubim reminded him that he had broken God's law. The high priest of Israel was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies once a year to gaze upon the mercy seat. I'm sure he must have felt, on each occasion, I do not belong here in the holy presence of God, for I am a sinner. The cherubim are real and powerful beings. However, cherubim in the Bible often represented heavenly things. They were integrated into the design of the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle by God's command. The cherubim shown in Ezekiel 10 not only have wings and hands, but are also full of eyes, surrounded by wheels within wheels. Yet, Ezekiel also paints a grim tone in chapter 10. The cherubim did more than protect God's holiest place from those who had no right to be there. They also ensured the right of the high priest to enter the holy place with blood as the mediator of the people with God. The cherubim will not deny access to the throne to the humblest Christian. They assure us that we can come boldly because of Christ's work on the cross. The veil in the temple was torn. The morning star, the book of Isaiah 14, introduces us to a being known as Lucifer. Lucifer literally means light bringer in Latin. The word is translated as morning star in Hebrew. Lucifer was portrayed as a bright, resplendent and wonderful deity in all languages. Melchizedek. Now we discuss the only human on our list, a character in the Bible more mysterious than the person of Melchizedek. When we first meet him, he is living in the time of Abraham. Even the name Melchizedek carries an air of mystery. He makes a quiet entry into the scripture canon. Who is he? Why is there so much discussion about him? 
He is mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments. Our epic story begins with a man named Abraham, true to his name. Many of us are not familiar with how names work in Hebrew and in the Bible. Names in the Bible are not just descriptive, they also carry authority. For example, the name God gave to Adam meant from the earth, describing what Adam was made of. A name can sometimes relate to the role of the named in the biblical narrative, as in the case of Nabal, a foolish man whose name means fool. Names in the Bible can represent human hopes and divine revelations, or are used to illustrate prophecies. So what is the meaning of the name Melchizedek? The name Melchizedek has significant meaning. In Hebrews 7 verse 2, it means king of righteousness, or the king is righteous. This name implies that the person with this name is just and correct in their actions. It is an appropriate name for a ruler or leader who upholds justice and righteousness in their realm. Melchizedek is used to explain the mysteries of Jesus. Just as Melchizedek is the king of peace, Jesus is also the king of peace. In the prophecy of Isaiah about the coming Messiah, he says, the second information about Melchizedek that can be discovered in Genesis 14 is that he presented Abraham with bread and wine, priest of the Most High God. Genesis 14 and verse 18 tells us he was priest of the Most High God. According to the Holy Scriptures, there is only one God who is the Most High. This title belongs to the God whom Abraham worshipped. He alone ruled over all gods and was the one before whom all gods should kneel. The priesthood that Melchizedek possessed came before the priesthood of Aaron and the Levites. Melchizedek blessed Abraham by the Most High God. Melchizedek acknowledged in Genesis 14 verse 20 that the Most High God had given Abraham the ability to defeat the enemies. The order and mystery of Melchizedek are used to explain Jesus, the man who had no beginning and no end. The interesting view about Melchizedek is that he is never given a beginning or an end. This priesthood of Melchizedek is a priesthood that would continue to the end of time. In the New Testament, the reference to Melchizedek is in Hebrews. This chapter draws comparisons between the priesthood of the Old Testament and the priesthood that the Lord Jesus now possesses. Hebrews 6 verse 20, where Jesus entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 provides us with more information about Melchizedek than any other passage in the Bible. The writer focuses on a specific incident during the meeting of Abraham and Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 verses 1 to 4. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth of everything. First, by translation of his name, he is king of righteousness and then also King of Salem, that is, King of Peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest perpetually. Now pause and consider how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. Abraham is considered the father of the Israelites, God's people he held in high esteem because of his role. Despite this, Abraham submitted to the authority of Melchizedek and gave him a tenth of the spoils of battle. As great as Abraham was, he knelt before Melchizedek. His genealogy, we learn in verse 3, that Melchizedek was without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. It should also be noted the fact that Melchizedek resembled the Son of God. This is a very significant point to make demonstrating that he is a type of an even greater priest, the Lord Jesus. His city, the city of peace, prophetically depicted in the work of the Lord Jesus, who brought us peace. Abraham demonstrated his acceptance of Melchizedek's priesthood by presenting a tenth of everything he had. It is clear from verses 9 and 10 that Abraham was a type of the future Levitical priesthood that was about to be established. The Angel of Death Perhaps we have heard of the angel of death, but what about an angel of death? There is a distinction between the two. We see this chapter appear in Exodus. For those familiar with the angel of death, because the Egyptians refused to release the enslaved Israelites, 
God sent various plagues upon them, the worst of which was the last plague. The last plague involves the angel of death. Exodus 11 verses 1 to 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. Moses returned to the royal chambers for one last interview with the king. Exodus 11 verses 4 to 5. So Moses said, This is what the Lord says. About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt will die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There were wars in the past, and there will be in the future. Egypt had just experienced nine plagues, and more national disasters were on the way, but there would never be another wave of mourning like this one. As in the previous disasters, the Hebrew population would be spared. There will be an exodus. I will visit Egypt, said God. Tonight I will invade every house where there is no blood on the door, but there will be blood on the doors of my people, and they will be spared. That night, history was made because the people believed in the man of God and followed God's plan. As a result, the Lord told them, Pharaoh refused to comply, and as a result, exposed himself and his people to the wrath of the Lord. The night no one slept, Exodus 12, verses 29 to 30, and it came to pass at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh rose up at night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not someone dead. He fulfills his word. The destroying angel spared no one who was not prepared, not even the king. The clammy fingers of death tormented like a horrible affliction, but they did not touch any of God's people. The word of God tells us there was not a residence in Egypt where someone had not died. Think about it, what a shocking night that was. My mind cannot fully conceive that night. A great multitude marched through the streets toward the border, while the wails and cries of the mourning Egyptians echoed in the darkness. The angel of death is another name for the destroying angel. God used angelic beings, celestial messengers of some kind, on various occasions to bring judgment on sinners on earth. This being is referred to as a destroying angel in various biblical translations. There are no clear biblical evidences that a single angel was designated as a destroying angel or an angel of death. The most we can say is that references to a destroying angel in the Bible are to a celestial being or beings who came to destroy those under God's judgment. Instead of destroyer, some translations use angel of death. In Hebrews 11 verse 28, this being is referred to as the destroyer of the firstborn. Surprisingly, the original Hebrew text of Exodus 12 verse 23 does not mention an angel, simply stating that the destroyer, the one who causes harm, or the one who inflicts damage, will kill the firstborn of Egypt. Psalm 78 describes the plagues in Egypt and summarizes them as the unleashing of a band of destroying angels. The Hebrew word for angel is used here, but it does not refer to a specific angel. God also sent a destroying angel, a celestial messenger who brought destruction to judge the Israelites as a result of David's sin in numbering the people. From that morning until the end of the appointed time, the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 people died. When the angel extended his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented from the disaster and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand! The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. When David saw the angel striking the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. The seraphim, what are seraphim? The seraphim are divine beings created by God to serve and worship. These six-winged angelic creatures are constantly present at the throne of God. 
The prophet Isaiah tells us that seraphim are six-winged, burning angels that surround God as he sits on his exalted throne and continually worship God. Isaiah 6. The seraphim also minister to the Lord and serve as his agents of purification, as demonstrated by the cleansing of Isaiah's sins before he began his prophetic ministry. The term seraphim appears in the Bible only in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6 is the only passage in the Bible that uses the term seraphim, which means the burning ones. Isaiah describes his intense vision of God's heavenly court in that biblical chapter. The prophet specifically saw God seated on an exalted throne, surrounded by flying angels known as seraphim. The implication is that these assisting angels are delighted with God. The seraphim appear to be human, as Isaiah describes them having faces, hands, and voices. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 2. In the year of the death of King Uzziah, I saw the Lord seated on a high and exalted throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. These angels may appear as burning flames. The term seraphim derives from the Hebrew verb seraph, literally to burn with fire, or more specifically, to destroy with fire. The name might also allude to the function of the seraphim as agents of purification. God created the seraphim as sinless creatures, yet they are not to be confused with God. The importance of the seraphim's proximity to God, combined with their revealing praise, cannot be underestimated. When the seraphim say the whole earth is full of his glory, they are giving a first-hand account of what comes from the apex of heaven. We can see from the seraphim's supernatural perspective that God's glory is infinite, indescribably valuable, and so powerful that it cannot be contained in a single realm. His glory bursts through heaven, unfolds across the spiritual realm, and overflows throughout the earth. This revealed glory allows us to glimpse a holy God. To be holy means to be distinct and revered. This threefold invocation of the word holy to describe God's sacred nature appears only twice in the Bible, both times by angels. If someone is transported in vision to the throne of God, and if the pure and holy seraphim show such reverence in the presence of the Lord, how much more should we sinful creatures approach him with reverence? The angel's reverence for God should remind us of our own arrogance when we rush thoughtlessly into his presence as we often do, because we do not understand his holiness. In Revelation 4, John's vision of the throne of God was similar to Isaiah's, in reverence and awe. The living creatures gathered around the throne exclaimed, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The seraphim also ministered to God and served as his agents of purification. When Isaiah realized the celestial seraphim covering themselves before God to admit their unworthiness before the Lord, he became conscious of his own mortal sin and feared for his life. At that point, one of the seraphim took a live coal with tongs from the altar, brought it to Isaiah, and touched it to his lips. The seraphim assured Isaiah that his guilt was taken away, and his sin atoned for as a result of this act. Demons are personal beings. It is clear that demons possess personality attributes. Both Christ and the demons themselves use personal pronouns, I, me, and yours, when referring to each other. The demonic spirit within the possessed man, and not the man himself, was responsible for the demonic possession. Demonic possession occurs when a spirit resides within a human body and exhibits its own personality through the host body's personality. Supposedly harmless practices of occultism, spiritism, and others open the door to deception for believers and real demonic danger for unbelievers. People often engage in occultism or demonic things because something there seems to work. Unfortunately, it is not something in action, but someone in action, a demonic spirit. We can say that demons wish to occupy bodies for the same reason a vandal wants a spray can. A body is a weapon they can use to attack God.
demons also attack men because they despise God's image in man, so they try to disfigure that image, making the man loathsome. Demons have the same purpose in Christians, which is to ruin God's image, but their tactics are limited regarding Christians. Demonic spirits were disarmed by Jesus' work on the cross, though they can deceive Christians, trapping them with unbelief. Demons also have personal names. Jesus asked the demon, What is your name? Luke 8 verse 30. Jesus likely asked the demon's name to understand the full scope of the problem, knowing the man was filled with many demons, not just one. We should note that Legion is not a name. It was evasive, threatening, and intimidating. Speech and communication demonstrate personality. Demons spoke with Christ, and Christ spoke with the demons. They begged him not to send them into the abyss. The demons inhabiting this man did not want to be imprisoned in the abyss, which is the bottomless pit described in Revelation 9 verse 1, appearing to be a place of confinement for certain demonic spirits. Demons exercised will and appealed to Christ not to cast them into the abyss, but to allow them to enter the pigs. Christ's authority over them is essentially a demand of his will over theirs, a command they had to obey. Demons have intelligence. They were aware of the identity of the Lord Jesus. One of them recognized Paul and the ministry he was leading. To a slave girl, the Spirit also allowed her to discern confidential information through divination or soothsaying. Acts 16 verses 16 to 17. Demons are spiritual beings. Demons are disembodied spirits. They are completely devoid of any material form. Demons belong to the spiritual realm, and their only manifestation is the problems they cause. Some are more evil than others. The Bible speaks of degrees of wickedness among demons. Jesus said he was casting out a demon. When the demon left, the Word of God tells us that, although Satan had bound people, Jesus revealed his authority by overcoming his evil forces, freeing the captives, and dividing Satan's spoil. Number 10, Lucifer, a personality referred to as Lucifer, appears in Isaiah 14. The Latin root of Lucifer means the light bringer, while the Hebrew translation is morning star. Lucifer was depicted as a radiant, bright, and majestic being in any language. He was a high-ranking angel. Lucifer was one of God's chief angels, alongside Michael and Gabriel in God's heavenly hosts. However, at some point, Lucifer made a grave mistake. He challenged God. Luke 10 verse 18, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. As a master of slander or defamation, he continues to seek to undermine various forms of authority that God has established, both in the church and in the world. When Lucifer was expelled from heaven, he did not stop his rebellion but continued to establish his own kingdom in opposition to God's kingdom. Lucifer's heart was lifted up in pride because of his beauty, and that was the reason he was expelled from the Mount of God. What was Lucifer's initial motivation? What was the original sin? Pride. The original sin was committed in heaven, not on earth. It was not drunkenness, not adultery, nor even lying. It was a matter of pride. It still is the deadliest sin of all. Many churchgoers would never dream of committing adultery or getting drunk, but they are easily seduced by pride without recognizing how harmful it is. Lucifer was so beautiful that he took pride in himself. His pride completed the transformation of Lucifer to Satan. God had given Lucifer his power, authority, beauty, and wisdom, but Lucifer's wrong attitude turned those gifts into instruments for his own destruction. I'm shocked to realize that men and women called and equipped by God still today make the same tragic mistake that Lucifer did. Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 15 examines the motive behind Lucifer's rebellion. Lucifer's desire was to be on the same level as God. He imagined himself to be so intelligent, beautiful, and majestic that he supposedly thought, I could be God. According to the scriptures, Lucifer undermined the loyalty of a third of God's angels and drew them into his rebellion and fall. Biblical scholars generally agree that Lucifer was in charge of orchestrating worship in heaven. He was a musical master who continues to use music to enchant people today. 
Lucifer was in charge of God's sanctuary in heaven, responsible for religious services. He was the cherub that covered the place where God's presence was manifested. He was responsible for music. He was an artist. He was very successful. Then he rebelled and fell. Pride, the battle lines are drawn. He was expelled from the presence of God after taking pride in his wisdom and beauty and after plotting his rebellion against God. His treacherous angels were also expelled with him. Lucifer was, perhaps, the wisest and most beautiful of all God's creatures, but the scriptures say his heart was lifted up. The fall of Lucifer, Satan, began from within before leading to his downfall. Satan's counterattack, Satan, the fallen angel, enemy of God and man, retaliated. He had a particular enmity against man for two reasons. First, he could attack the image of God in man, as man visibly represented God to the rest of creation. Satan could not touch God, but could wage war against God's very image in man. His delight was to profane that image, to destroy it, to humiliate it, and for this purpose, he worked tirelessly. Satan's action aimed to disfigure and degrade the image of God in man, seeking to make man repugnant. He tried to destroy not only the physical image, but also the moral and spiritual character that reflects God. Satan has a special hatred for Christians, because through them God's image is restored and reflected in the world. His strategy is to try to corrupt and divert Christians from their path, seeking to weaken their faith and compromise their testimony. In response to Satan's fall, God did not remain passive. He intervened, sending Jesus Christ, the perfect expression of his image, to redeem and restore humanity. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, there is salvation and the opportunity to be transformed into the image of his Son. This transformation is a continuous process in the Christian's life, where we are gradually shaped into the likeness of Christ. This happens as we submit to the Holy Spirit and live according to the teachings of Christ. By doing so, we reflect God's image more clearly and brightly in a world in desperate need of His light and truth. Satan, aware that he cannot destroy God, directs his fury and deception against humanity, trying to divert people from God and the truth of the gospel. However, the final victory belongs to God. Through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, Satan was defeated, and those who place their faith in Christ have the promise of eternal life and complete restoration to God's image. This ongoing spiritual conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan, is a central theme in the biblical narrative. It reminds us of the importance of staying faithful to God and resisting Satan's temptations and deceptions, knowing that in Christ we have the victory and the promise of a glorious future with God. I invite you to leave your valuable opinion in the comments. If this content was valuable to you, I ask you to support me with your subscription. Leave your like and click on one of the two videos that will appear to continue watching us. Together we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here. Until next time, and may the light illuminate your path. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.